pressure. Tonight's Modern Men is powered by the Hero Initiative. Are you interested in becoming a hero? Go to theheroinitiative.org to see how you can become a hero to those comic creators in need. Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Monday night. It's time for one of my favorite shows of the week. Modern Men, ep we're already at episode 31. Dang. So, of course, I'm not here by myself. Uh, we got Comic Man Andy. Oh, my God. The it, it's almost it's like almost down to the Comic Core logo. Dang. Getting there. It's getting there. This beard is gaining subscribers faster than Perry Comics. So, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, man. Wow. By the way, big congratulations, man, on that Thursday show. It keeps growing in popularity. Uh, what do you think about that Thursday show, Andy? I'm digging it. Um, we're having a good time. We're just trying to find something. Go organic with it. Roll for an hour. We always go over by an hour and a half, and it's a great time. Yeah, that kind of sounds to me like going over an hour and a half, man. We've never done that on this show before, but let me get to our next panelist here. Drew Manchu, baby. How are you doing? Oh, tonight? man, what's going on? I've been, uh, you know, as as they say in the music biz, uh, in the lab, uh, cutting up some tracks, <laughs> laying them down on wax. <laughs> Just Check out the Comic Core for, uh, for some uh, new posted <laughs> videos from me. Awesome. Some of them featuring Carson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that that clip was great. Who likes to use my likeness? You, I don't even do whatever you want with it. Everyone else does it anyway. But we got a special guest waiting in the backstage. Before I introduce our special guest tonight, I'm gonna hop into the chat real quick. We got it, wait, Chris Barrett wasn't first. Oh man, this has been a crazy day. But you know, I'm still happy he's here. We got Skeff's comic knowledge. What is going on, Skeff? How you doing? Nice to see you in the chat. And of course, I'm a Freud. I've got some bad news. <laughs> we got the Cosmic King. He's here for that farmhand. We all love him so farmhand. Skeff says he loves farmhand and Chew as well. Yeah, absolutely. Rob Guillory greatness coming at you here in a few. Of course, Andy's in the chat. Scott Evans, how you doing, man? Nice to see you out tonight. Stream Elements Robot, our buddy. He's protecting the chat. Jay Blitz Comics, how you doing, man? Nice to see you in tonight. Uh, without so further Jay ado, Blitz. if you guys know anything at all about the Comic Core, been following us for a long time, you know, our guest tonight, he is a gigantic Rob Guillory fan. He loves him some chew. He loves farmhand, especially that issue number two. And I made that rhyme just for him. We got the Great Legend Show, man. How you doing tonight? <laughs> Man, this is a great legend coming at you live, and it's great to be surrounded by some modern men. And, man, I tell you what, there ain't nothing like it. Farm, man. We got a little trade here. Now, good story about this quick trade. I was with Seawood19 in Baltimore one time when we got this thing. And down the line, sure enough, Rob Gellery was there, man. He was in the house. and we. I was just like, I totally had forgotten, you know, that Rob Gillery's even going to be there. You know, I, I don't know where my mind was wandering, but humongous fan of chew and even more of a humongous fan of farm Man because not only does he illustrate it he writes the book too so we're looking forward to bringing you some farm hand live tonight fans yeah absolutely we're going to talk about farm Man, but after farm Man, we got a topic lined up for tonight we're going to talk about some video games based on comic books so we're going to talk about the best and we're going to cover a little bit of the worst. So if you guys <laughs> like video games, uh, definitely stick around for that. And we're going to let you know what opportunities you guys have to meet some of your favorite creators through the Hero Initiative and in the midpoint of the show. But without further ado, uh, Legend, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> what does farmhand mean to you, man? Because I know you Ooh. love you some chew. We practice that I in know. the mirror all day yeah. today. <laughs> man. All right. Well, first off, like I said, you also get some awesome colors by Taylor Wells. You get some letters by Cody Chamberlain. And, man, the graphic design by Burton Durand. Bert Durand. Yeah, man. Anyways, this trade paperback of the first volume here is freaking phenomenal. It's issues one through five. And, man, it's coming at you live. Just the cover alone. Now, this guy here, his name's Jedediah Jenkins. You know, back in the day, you know, all he wanted to do was farm the land because 
he's all about that farm hand. <laughs> and I just love this whole story because you got a horror aspect. No issue one drags you in for that horror. So you're like kind of like blown away right away. If you don't know what farm hands about or whatnot, you're just going, Oh my God, this just got kind of crazy here. And then it just keeps on going along. And you know, you really do reap what you sow when you read this book, because volume one, it's called reap what was sown and man, Jedediah, you know, it's kind of like crossroads. You know, if you ever heard the story of Robert Johnson, soul is soul to the devil. So he can play those masterful Delta blues down at the crossroads, man, if you ever know about those secrets, but Jedediah did the same thing in the story. You know, it's only getting better and better. I'm still reading it currently. Uh, I don't want to go into too far of anything because I want to get y'all's opinion too. Of course, Jedediah's son is older now. His daughter's older. Um, Jedediah's son has two children of his own. He's married. Uh, his daughter's single, ex-military, and the daughter actually works as some security for um, Jedediah's business here, man. But uh, I, that's, I just think it's like, you know, one of the best, you know, the things that I love about image comics, you know, like Andy saga or Drew's um, saga or, or Carson, whatever image book you like to read. <laughs> oh, it, yours hey, is Carson far, like saga too. His is far, <laughs> man. But no, I mean, if you ha like, I love image books because they're the stories are created by the creators, man. I know it, and it sounds kind of weird and cliche, but the creators are creating the stories and it's their stories to tell. It's not like the Marvel DC, but really pleased with farmhand. And, uh, I've got all the singles so far, so I'm going to go ahead and collect the whole run. And then Carson, you know, when those deluxe hard covers mm -hmm. come out they, and I think he is going to go to 30 issues. I think that's what I heard. So that we'll was see what happens. Plan. That was uh, yeah. what he wrote in the original uh, farmhand letters page. I think it was issue three. Yeah. That's, That's right. awesome, man. All and right. Karsten, I've got some farmhand twos around here somewhere. I can't <laughs> even really find my own damn copy, which really <laughs> sucks. But I think some guy named J Joe came in my house. But anyway, what do y'all think about farmhand, you know? Yeah, so Drew, we've heard the legend's perspective on farmhand i know you wanted to make basically the counterpoint so Ooh, true. not ahead. really um not 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 exactly a counterpoint um but i i read these five issues um and i won't be reading issue six um Aww. i picked up issue one off the shelf and i did not pick up issue number two and i feel like um i'm all right not reading this not that it's not quality um I, I, you know, I, I don't want to get to a score right away, but I kind of broke it down. Um, like the art is great. The cartooning is great. The fact that he writes and draws the story is fantastic. Panel to panel. This is a really good book. Each page is a really well set up page that tells a good story. The characters are pretty well rounded. The, everything is pretty well built as a world. The problem is that the underlying narrative that's supposed to drag me to the next issue just doesn't exist for me. I, I don't it's like, oh, he sold his soul to the devil. To, it's a cool concept, but like nothing was there's this mystery building through the first five issues and nothing tells me that I need to figure out what that mystery was. Doesn't mean that it's not a good book, like like page to page. Like I would read anything that Rob Guillory wrote for at least five to six issues at this point, because the, the craftsmanship is there. The colors are perfect. Uh, the tone of these characters is great. It's just, for me, it's the differences between a, a series, like, uh, let's just put it in TV terms, like game of Thrones would drag you through the whole story. The, there are characters that are well-rounded throughout the whole thing and you can get good episodes, but it drags you through wanting to know the whole story whereas like law and order is a procedural where one you can sit down and watch one episode you don't need to watch the rest of the season there might be some threads throughout but you don't need to watch the whole season i think farmhand is kind of uh one of those long form stories that i really have no interest in but i can recognize that it's a really well put together really well drawn book by a writer who cares about these characters uh, i just don't think that the narrative is engaging for me you know, Drew, that's a great point you bring up because in 
also Guillory's work, you also have to appreciate the things that he hides in the panels. Like there's all kind of cool stuff he adds. I'm not going to go into too many, but I also want to remind Drew of this thing right here. The panel, that's uh, the uh, chapter, what was it? Vault, the or, cover or, too. Yeah, cover of issue two, the guita- the decapitation off the tree stump. And also, did you look at Jedediah's thumb? Yeah, yeah, he cut thumb. his own thumb off. And you know, and he and he got the, uh, he was the human uh, test. And the he was the human test, and he got the plant to become the thumb. And truly, Carson, it was a green thumb. I there mean, was only like really thing. one thing in in volume one that grabbed my attention at all. And they didn't go back to it. And that was the chick with the flowers growing out of her spine. They did. They did. did in, in issue five? Yep, we'll get to it. Uh, well, I, I'm, I must have skimmed right over it trying yeah. to get here in time. Because it just like, it was like a little, it was an intriguing image. But like the, the whole, the whole deal with like the, it's starting to infect everything around them. Yeah, okay. It's like been there, done that. Um. I, I, I enjoy the way that he works with these characters, and I think that if you put him in a more mundane story without the kind of sci-fi trappings of it, I think I'd probably enjoy it more. Um, and you know, I haven't read Chew yet. I'm waiting for it to get chosen in some form on this show. I've got the first three volumes just sitting there waiting for a reason to read them instead of something else. Um, but it's just a... No, I'm not saying uh, Chris Barrett says so I watch Law and Order but not Game of Thrones. I'm saying that there's that there's a distinct difference in the way that those stories are told. And it's not an indication of quality, is what I'm saying. Uh, different barns for different farms. Yeah, there you go. Um, I can definitely recognize Guillory's talent, and I think that um, maybe it's just the way that the overarching plot may be structured doesn't grab my attention. Um and he's uh, got an option by AMC for a TV show, which I think is awesome. I think get Donald Glover to play uh, uh, Ezekiel, and and it would be an absolute winner. I think there's a lot in this story that I really enjoyed. I enjoyed um, what was his name, Tree, the the yeah, football playing Reverend. Mm-hmm. I really like that scene where they he saved them from uh, from getting hijacked in the parking lot. And then uh, the dude's like, hey, your new church is like next to a shitty liquor store. You know that, right? And he's like, yeah, that's why it's there. He's like, but I haven't seen you on Sundays. He's like, look, man, the Lord rested too. And the next next scene's him sparking the bong, watching the Jeffersons. And it's <laughs> yeah, an actual what? picture, actually a picture of the Jeffersons or whatever, or uh, Good Time Times or there. whatever it was. Yeah. So like, uh, yeah, they just kind of like copy and paste the photo. I thought that was cool. Um Chris Barrett says this isn't Grader's note. Don't break things down. This is my show, Chris Barrett, and I'll do what I want. I'm taking your wrench. All right, so Andy, what did you think of Farmhand? Initial impressions. Okay, um, I'm not gonna lie. I I messed up bad and slept on this book when it came out because every time I pass by the image section now and I see an image number one, I don't grab many more. There's just too many of them to pay attention to, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm mad at myself for sleeping on this book. For me, this book has an element of horror, an element of comedy, an element of drama. Uh, it has so it's so multifaceted of a story, um, and there's so many different parts. I, it's just this for me it was like watching X Files as a kid. <laughs> Every issue that I'm going to grab and read seems like it's uh, almost kind of like a, a bit of sci-fi, a little horror, a little terror, a little. A little comedy, a little drama, a little bit of everything mixed in. And um, I absolutely love his little quips that he throws in here. The license plate on the um, goon's vehicle says, we merc for cash. Um, mm-hmm. Stuff like that. Then in um, the laboratory area where they call the melon patch, it says sex organ and breast implants, adults only. And all the dudes are all lined up giggling like school kids. Just all the little corpse he fits in here and the farting uh, uh, security guy sitting there asleep at the security station. Just it's got a great element of comedy to it. Yeah, it's it's sci fi based. Um, and I, I'm a big sci fi. I'm a big buff of sci fi. And when I first look at this on the shelf, it didn't scream sci fi to me at first. Um, I loved it. 
I'm not going to filibuster anymore about uh, the actual issue itself. We can go dig deeper because there's actually, I think, a lot of finer points in here that we can discuss as we move along. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, for me, I mean, this is the first time I've sat down and read all five insu- issues in a row, like Legend. Uh, I collected as it came out. I even had the ash can before it came out and all that stuff. So I was a fan of his work on Chew. So I was pretty much on board as soon as I heard this book was one of his projects. So I, I really enjoyed it. It's, it's kind of slow for me to get into again, I'll be honest. But once I did, I really enjoyed it. I liked the first issue. Like the intro of it where they have this whole premise uh, that, you know, it's kind of like Godfather 3, basically, with Michael Corleone going, you know, well, just when I thought I was out, they dragged me back in. And he has this dream of, like, he's just farming crops and he sees an eyeball on the ground that basically turns out it's his dad. And then these roots get him and then they're dragging him back into this kind of almost corrupt town in Louisiana. And then I wanted to highlight this panel I believe it's the opening page of issue number two. Uh, you know, one of Legend's all-time favorite issues of comic books ever. But basically, this is like Guillory at his finest. You see the entire history of Zeke, basically, up until the literal point where, he, you know, you're at present day, he's having a cup of coffee to where he's being fed as a child. I absolutely love this scene. It tells you everything you need to know, basically, about Jedediah in a nutshell. So you see that he was a kid. Uh, you know, he liked going to movies with his parents. Unfortunately, his mother got sick. Uh, you don't exactly know how at that point. Uh, but then you see his mother passed away. He's still working with his father on the farm. Then they have their differences. He becomes an alcoholic. He's sleeping around. He goes to AA. And then it somehow culminates with him uh, with his father's house. And he's just unhappy, especially about this Mare Thorne character you find a little bit more about. So I, I thought that was kind of cool. Basically tells you the entire origin, everything you need to know in one page. So I thought that was uh, pretty cool. So Andy, why did you think about the main character, Zeke? Do you think he, he's worth carrying this book? Or were you more interested in just the overlaying plot with Jedediah and the farm? Well, I, I think the greater story at hand here is about Ezekiel and his family and how, how they cope with um everything that's happening and they're getting drawn back into this um the old uh what is it mo thorn who becomes the mayor was the scientist partner of his dad jebediah and how the town's changing around them and uh, yeah kind of how they cope um and i've already forgotten your question so perfect but (laughs) um that's where really where i think the story lies because if you notice there's a lot of tidbits in here where uh, Guillory draws back to um, Ezekiel, like uh, when the when the tree finds him and they're talking out in front of the liquor store in the, or he's talking out in front of the liquor store before the tree saves him. He's got his keys in his hands and you notice the coin that says he's two years sober. It gives you an idea what kind of times passed for him and his family coming back to town there. So, uh, the my second and third, almost third read through of this revealed a lot more of those little hidden tidbits. Um, about the family and how how much time has passed and how much hurt they've gone through when he left his father and, and after everything that happened. And uh, let's be fair, you know, Ezekiel, Andy, and Jebediah all dealt with um, their mother slash wife passing away, mm-hmm. essentially breaking up the family, in my opinion. Yeah. And when it comes to the farm, too, I, I wanted to show this panel off you uploaded. Uh, there's almost like a Willy Wonka type of lore. Yeah to this farm but there's also like the the underbelly of this is like do you truly trust jedediah um and all the other stuff that's going on like the the fbi is kind of investigating him people are trying to steal uh all the stuff that's going on trying to figure out the secret of how he's actually doing this with the seeds and everything so legend what did you think about the first look we got of uh, jedediah's farm or factory or whatever you want to call it here yeah, it, it was so cool because it is, it's a freaking throwback to that classic movie, man, where old Willy Wonka, oh, what's his face? God, see no evil here, no evil. Gene Wilder. Oh, there he goes. Yeah. Man, what a classic. Good singer, too. But um, yeah, you got to see all the facades. You got to see just 
things moving around. It's kind of like if you've ever been to Epcot Center or one of those rides where you're going through and you see animated type scenes. I think there was actually one of those in Mask of the Phantasm as well. One of those kind of rides. Uh, it was a good Joker Batman movie. But yeah, man, freaking awesome. And I love the uh, where you actually got to see different parts, like the tree with the... Uh, the limbs and all that that's the good stuff yeah yeah like, like when they get in that little area man oh and dude that dog gets loose around there and like i think it was issue three or something yep. yeah freaky classy <laughs> love yeah, that no, stuff i awesome. love that artwork man i'm i'm mm -hmm. i don't know i'm going five out of five on that artwork right there <laughs> no one does it better than rob guillory well, you know, in the little comedy quips, like I'm talking about, this is hilarious. There's an area here where they have a scalp bush. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's the the scalps. This is essentially his play on a joke about a Merkin bush. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just hilarious. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we can kind of sample some of the uh, Andy's picks here of, you know, some of the art we really enjoyed for sure. Oh, yeah. We even had this, like, uh, the Mikhail, I think was his name. This, yeah. Uh, kid. Uh, who basically you're introduced to him when he's trying to infiltrate uh, Jedediah's factory here. And then later he's going to the school with Zeke's kid, and Zeke's kid basically wants to be best friends with this guy. But I I'm looking forward to I I because I kind of stopped reading because I actually want to slowly collect the hardcovers eventually. Uh, but I I'm curious to see what happens with Mikhail and Zeke's son uh, because Jedediah – decides to just give this guy an arm because he's using this fake arm to try to steal the secrets of Jedediah's seed. So, Drew, what did you think about this whole plot line? Uh, I, I thought that the best part of this plot line was the meeting of the children where Zeke's son is basically like, I know that you're Batman. And he's like, who told you my secret identity? Right, And then he's like, no, no. And he's like, what do you want to stay quiet? He's like, just be my friend. And then, they, and then they shake hands. And the next scene is him and his sister. And he's like, and that's how I made my first friend. And I don't care about the rest of it. Like, I don't, it, it's the dumbest kind of logic that we're going to let a, a Russian child go who had a <laughs> robot arm who was infiltrating your facility and beating the shit out of your security. And then you're going to give him a, a plant arm and let him go. Like, of course, that's going to come back and bite him in the ass. It's like the worst kind of lazy foreshadowing. And and I think that that's what the problem I have with this book is that it's just it nails everything. But for some reason, can't find a way to pull it together. I think that like all I, Andy was saying that Zeke's the strength is in the story of Zeke and his family. And I agree. You can tell that there's a lot of. um autobiographical stuff with Guillory in here. He's putting himself into it. The guy is a comic book writer and artist. So, and he's got issues with his dad, apparently. And, it, and, and it speaks to a lot of being black in Louisiana as well, which is something that I'm sure he's coming from a, a, a place of experience with. You can tell this is a very personal project to him. And those personal things are where this really shines. I think the art is really great. I think the humor is fantastic. And there's little jokes that are hidden on the page. You guys are dead on with that. I think that the sci-fi stuff is really high-minded and inventive and, and tying it to a moral dilemma one way or the other is, is classic. I just think that all of that falls flat in the face of where this book shines in the art and the comedy. And I think, I think that if you took all the sci-fi elements out of this book, it would probably be better for it. That's just my thought process. I feel like it kind of gets muddied and you have a hard time figuring out what it is. Like I said, I look at it, I read it and each page is great. Each panel is great. I just think the whole thing all together just isn't for me. Uh, and that's where I'll leave it. Gotcha. That so, comment makes me wonder what X Files would have been if they took the sci-fi out of it. X Files was boring when they had the sci-fi in it. I'm going to ignore that comment. Look, anyway. go back, go back and watch <laughs> X Files now after we've had the TV that we've had with the ability for the special effects that we've gotten, and the I first like, two seasons dude. of that show are like nigh unwatchable. I, I watch them. Every give year. me the nineties. I give me. Yeah, I watch it every year. My wife's owned yeah. it on DVD and V. We still have it on VHS. Wow. Damn, old school. Okay. I mean, the premise of the story is essentially he's uh, Jebediah is given a, a vision of this seed, right? 
and from this seed he can create uh a god cell what is it um what's that cell work that they're stem working cell. on yes yeah, yeah a, a stem cell and that stem cell can reproduce any portion of the human body right we see uh, a nose replaced we see arms replaced we see his own thumb replaced which becomes a green thumb which is hilarity in itself classic classic gillery um i think i totally missed like the premise of that earlier when i was talking but um that's a pretty important part of the book as well that stem cell that um what do they call it the jebediah seed Mm -hmm. essentially and they're growing limbs in a most hilarious fashion in a facility off of trees off of bushes right out of the ground and one of you guys made the comment about the dog fuzz nuts that comes in and eats the eats yeah. one of the uh, the plants in its most raw form, and it just mutates into this crazy <laughs> monster. I digress, though. I mean, continue, please. So I actually did kind of want to before I ask my last question. I did want to point out what you thought about. There's this one scene. I think it's at the beginning of issue five where they're actually like you. You probably ask yourself like they're growing fingers, hearts, boobs, everything. What about the human brain? And you actually get that scene where. Uh, Thorn and Jedediah, they're actually experimenting on a brain. He's like blowing and tapping on the glass, mm -hmm. and then it hatches this eye, and then he starts panicking, like, no, we, we will not touch the brain, and that's basically like the difference between them creating life, basically, out of this whole seed they got going on, and you know, what's probably to come in the series, where you're probably going to have probably this Thorn character or somebody similar that basically be a plant-grown life organism, uh, and as you can see at the, the cut, I don't know. Yeah, I think you uploaded it. As you can see kind of by this last panel here, uh, and then there's another one after that where you actually see these people on the buses traveling to other cities in America where these people, they have been infected by Jedediah seeds. Yep. Uh, they are definitely like not in control of themselves anymore. And it's spreading, you know, unfortunately like a virus. And we know a little bit about that now, don't we? Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's kind of the horrifying way this book ends with all these people being infected with some sort of Jedediah seed virus, and they're going to other cities with it. So, what did you guys think about that? Drew, there's there's your there's your um, bridge right there. She's standing there with the red hair and the the teal hoodie with the black pants and the two pink suitcases. Yeah, let roses. me know how it works out. Yeah, look at the roses on her back spine. That's that's your girl from the tub, right? Yeah, let me know how it works out. <laughs> well they're all on their way because they're all infected they know what caused it you <laughs> saw her calling him in the tub she's like Jedediah something ain't right here blah 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 so he's like alright well you're gonna have to come here I guess but anyways they all are gonna be coming to uh, <laughs> coming to that farm man, in <laughs> six, man. so man there, there's just a great freaking story when Carson mentioned the brain that was a total throwback classic 1931 Frankenstein movie, you know, the old poor Dwight Fry, you know, wasn't too smart, you know, the humpback guy. His name is Dwight Fry. Actually, his name in the movie was Fritz. He grabbed the uh, brain, right, of the uh, the smart person and he freaking drops it because he gets startled. So he grabs another brain and it's the brain of a criminal. But anyway, just to have the brain in a little thing, that was a throwback, man. Classic throwback, Frankenstein. And again, Carson, like you said, brain, you know, basically creating life. I mean, like old Henry Frankenstein, you know, he created Boris Karloff and he came alive, man. It's pronounced right. Frankenstein. <laughs> oh, yeah, that one. <laughs> the Wilder, yeah, Gene. <laughs> Classic Wilder. <laughs> All right, so my last question before we kind of get to our final thoughts here. Or I just want to know what you guys' favorite Easter eggs and fun little nitpicks in the back where we talked a little bit about it. I'm going to show mine first. Mm -hmm. I had to pick this one up here. Um, this is where <laughs> his wife has the Etsy store, and she's all proud of it and everything. And also the coffee mugs. Like, the, the all the notes where the coffee mugs are at. This one just says, you has coffee. Uh, but I like the, the hats she has picked out, like the Elmer Fudd. Uh, of course, uh, Guillory, he drew some Thor uh, here and there, so he has to have the Asgardian look. And, of course, you got Mason Savoy from Chu. Mm. And, of course, I hear there's a ton of hidden ones in the story. I was looking all over for them. But you got the Chog instance here, once again, from Chu. So you got to love yourself the Chog. So, uh, Andy, did you have a favorite Easter egg in particular? Because I know you were bringing plenty of them up. The the coffee cups, uh, 
case point, he's got to be a coffee lover. Rob Guillory's got to be a coffee lover. I'm mm-hmm. a coffee lover. Every time I turn a page and I see a coffee cup, I'm now looking for those little quips on the outside. You has coffee on the eighth day, eighth day God created coffee. I mean, uh, those were great. I enjoyed that quite a bit. And now you've got me looking through here, looking for more. <laughs> Drew, any highlights you want to talk about? I mean, there's a lot of layers to all the art. I don't know what's an Easter egg because I'm not really familiar with his previous work. Uh, I've never read Chew, so I wouldn't get any of those Easter eggs. Uh, but I was a big fan of the uh, the one page. It was the shitty security guard and all the things he's done so far <laughs> that were going to get him fired. Yeah. Chopped the one guy's <laughs> arm off while he was trimming the arm tree. And then he's like gotten the... Uh, pharmaceuticals and he's eating the fingers off this hand with like magic mushroom fingers and he's like tripping <laughs> balls. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, I can't I can't think of any myself. I mean, like they're just all fun when you see him and you just kind of smile, you know. He, it's like whenever, you know, I say something funny that I, I know only Carson will get and he kind of <laughs> smiles or chuckles, then you know you popped him one of them Jedi seeds. <laughs> yeah, he's just the kind of artist that like Oh, you're going to draw something with wall space. Well, what might be on that wall? Well, an advertisement might be on that wall. Well, an advertisement for what? Let's find a way to make it funny. Like, oh, we're going to put a license plate in this scene. It might as well be a vanity plate that tells a joke. He doesn't he he's he doesn't waste space with his jokes. Like there, there are a lot of visual gags that happen throughout this book. And he's masterful. Uh, I I wish that this was a story that was driving me to read issue number six and that filibuster Uh, you just said you know you can sum it all down with that filibuster can sum down to one hashtag hashtag classic guillory classic guillory that's (laughs) all it is it's classic guillory it's magic it's what walt disney had it's what rob guillory has pure magic all right guys classic guillory so we're about the halfway point of our show so it's time to give this book a score so drew i'm gonna let you go first what are you scoring this it's 8.5 um, I'm not going to let the fact that I don't enjoy the greater narrative uh, let me pass too much judgment on this book. Um, Scott Evans says right here in his comment, the story lever left me morning warm. The art was mediocre at best. I don't agree with the second part of that statement, but the first I do. The story never left me wanting more, um, but I thought that the art was fantastic. All the gags were like classic Mad Magazine style uh, art. He does a great job. He's got a vision, and uh, it's just... Uh, Unfortunately for me, it's not the vision that I was looking for. I say uh, 8.5. Andy? I'm going to go with a solid 9.0. Um, it's definitely not perfect, but the, like Drew said, the art is on point. I enjoyed the comedy tremendously. I enjoyed it being very multifaceted, but Drew's, Drew's right. I mean, um, there are some layers and areas it doesn't do well, but I think that's because it's so multifaceted that it kind of lacked in a couple areas, but not 9.0. I'm going to read on. I really, in fact, I'm probably going to read volume two tonight. Yeah. Uh, when I stopped reading this on my second or third read, um, I wanted to keep going because I had it digitally uh, available as well. Um, and I got to give a big shout out before we move on to uh, White Whale Comics for gifting me this. Mm, and his oh, traveling, nice. He's calling it the traveling library. We're putting it together. It's a box. It's going to have four or five trades in it. And you're going to be able to take one, leave one, need one, take one, leave one kind of a thing. And it's just going to be randomly a okay to people in the community full of trades. When you find a trade you've never read before, grab one, throw something else in there that you think somebody else would like and send it on to the next person. Mm. So uh, he 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 threw in that signed copy and that's one I hadn't read before. And I definitely wanted to, um, I'm with you, Carson. I want to get the hardcovers, so I'm going to put this right back in that box and send it to another community member to read. Nice. Legend? Well, for me, you know, Farmhand, issues one through five, let me just say something. This is awesome, but let me say something that I don't fanboy out. You know, I've met a lot of legends in this industry, you know, the comic books. I've seen them all. I've done them all. I had them all. Good times, man. Good rhymes. But only two people I fanboy ever have fanboyed out before. And one was Don Rosa. Of course, you know, Don Rosa, I mean, living legend there. (laughs) I mean, he's like Bruno San Martino, but he likes those peppers, you know. But the other is Rob freaking Guillory, man. When me and Carson met Guillory, it was one of the greatest moments of my life. We forgot to take pictures. We were so excited, man. But, damn, you know, we'll see Rob Guillory. I mean, you know, 
Andy shared a great deal with us in the Modern Men chat about how Rob Guillory wrote a little message on the, the little comment thing. Remember, Andy? That was pretty awesome. But yeah, farmhand, I mean, I'm giving it a 10 out of 10. 10.0 Jim freaking mint Rob Guillory's farmhand. Awesome. I think for me, I think I'm going to go 9.2. I absolutely, I love this story. I'm really looking forward to the image. Awesome. Deluxe collected edition. That's, I'll definitely be getting that. My one critique, and I was kind of just thinking about this as you guys were giving your scores, is, you know, they did, they threw so much at the wall in the first volume that I feel like if you kind of took out the plot, maybe with Mary Thorne and saved her for more volume two, uh, I'd maybe leave in tree, maybe introduce them in volume two. I feel like there were so many new characters you're already being introduced to. It would have been nice just to let some of those breathe a little bit longer. But like you said, Legend, hashtag cash it. I can't even talk. I'm so excited. <laughs> hashtag great. classic Guillory, man. Classic. Art out of the park. I love those little nitpicks and Easter eggs in the back. Mm -hmm. I love the – it's like so Simpson-esque of all of his billboards. If there's like a billboard, there's usually a fun joke at the bottom of it. My all-time favorite Guillory gag is still like in Chew. I wish I could remember the issue. But there's one literally like this Chinese restaurant – just has a picture of Chong Lee in the background. No reason yeah. for Blood Sports. <laughs> yeah. The main bad guy from Blood Sports just in the background for no reason whatsoever. And it makes me laugh every single time. I I that. So another yeah. thing real quick about Farmhand. Andy brought up a good point. You know, back in the day when I broke in, you know, YouTube and all that stuff, the big book was Saga. I mean, people were talking about it. Everyone knew it was coming out. We all wanted to read it. More so because of the story, you know, we didn't think it was going to be worth, you know, worth a lot of money, but you never know. And man, we got that book. So from then on out, you know, I, I just couldn't get all the image number ones. You know, you can't, you can't, you know, you don't want to play keeping up with the Joneses. You know, you don't want to content buy when you don't like really want to spend no money on the damn things in the first place. So you just move along, you know, you kind of wait it out. So I missed Chew. You know, of course, I went back and got me a number one of a Rob Guillory Chew, but I went ahead and picked those up in the image hardcovers. And uh, this one here, if you missed it, hey, man, you can still get you a number one somewhere down the line. But the best thing is get these in the image deluxe hardcovers. You know, the first one will come with issue one through ten. That'll be the first two story arcs. Then they'll finish it off with probably another two to total out the 30 issues. And you're going to be saving money. They're beautiful. I mean, awesome. They do some of the best jobs on those image hardcovers, Carson. Oh, absolutely. All right. So that wraps up our opinions on Chew. Before we tell you what's going on with the Hero Initiative, I want to get into this chat because we did have some people join us. I didn't get a chance to say hi to him earlier, but we had Phil Ailing in the chat. What is going on, Phil? What up, Phil? Join us each and every week. So big thanks, Phil. Phil in the house, in the man. Chat and saying hi. We got Christy Shin in the chat. What is Yay! going on? Dude? What's up, Christy? Awesome. Like seeing her in the modern men chat tonight. Of course, my first subscriber ever. Fish Traffic. Fish Traffic. Fish hanging Traffic. out in the chat, telling everyone to smash that like button. Big thanks <laughs> for that. Skeff answered the question earlier. Uh, we asked what X Files would be like without the sci fi, and he simply <laughs> says Law and Order. I couldn't agree more. I was going to say it myself. I couldn't get a word in. So good yeah. job, Skeff. Uh, absolutely agree with that 100%. We got Rod the Recon. What is going on? Just a Recon and his comics. Always nice seeing Rod in the chats. Of course, Roddy, man. Jay Blitz, he's still with us in the chat as well. What's going on, Blitz, Jay man. Blitz? See Jay Blitz in the house. And Chris Barrett, man, you know, you guys know if there's a, a Comic Core video, Chris will be there. Sub up, Chris Barrett, man. Apparently, he's been putting out videos today. After this, I'm going to have to go see what he's been uploading. I cannot wait. Oh, man. Drew's nephew is in the chat, guys. Double S. He says, Farm Hand, Farm Hood. It's all good, great legend. We all love seeing double legend. Farm foot, chance. man. Awesome. Farm yeah, foot. I don't. I don't really like feet. I I, 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 yeah. Oh my god! Oh my god! Don't go there. I <laughs> don't like no zombie plant feet. You know, is that where they grow all the foot soldiers for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and, show? You know, clones, just a big clone thing. And one real quick thing, um, you know, with CB in the chat, there's another image book coming out. Y'all need to look out for. It looks really interesting. It's John Layman. And he's got a new Chew coming out. And it's C-H-U, not C-H-E-W, but it's C-H-U. Oh, it talks about his sister. 
old Tony Chu's sister. So she's got a power of her own. Hey, look at this guy. $2 super chat, CW. Nice. Well, big thanks to Rod. Jeff Tarika and Rod once again with a $2 super chat. Of course, proceeds from that will be going directly to the Hero Initiative. So big thanks once again to Rod, Just Tarika and his comics. A channel definitely worth your time. So huge Green, I wish it was green for once green because of that man, but big thumbs up just reeking in his comics. Let's be, actually, I want to say hi to Mike W. Rogers just joining us in the chat. The thing hasn't uploaded on this side yet, it's only on the YouTube side. As one thing, Scott Evans for being in the chat, so well, I don't think I shout him out yet. And I always respect his blunt opinions in the chat, he'll tell you what he thinks of a book for sure. And I, I is definitely that, respect that. Is that some Boland he has there on his little icon? Was oh, yeah, let's go ahead. We reviewed a killing joke, what was it, last week, two weeks ago? <laughs> I feel like it was just Brandon. yesterday, but yeah, I gotta love the Brian Boland. But let's take a peek and see what's going on at heroinitiative.org slash merchandise. I already dropped that link in the chat, so I'm gonna. We're going to share that screen, and we're going to hide that for Legend because I know that drives him crazy. Uh, but look at this, guys. You have an opportunity to meet a few people here. So you got Dan Brereton, which I hear pretty cool guys going to uh, moderate this a panel named Seawood19. Uh, so you can get a uh, chat and a bus sketch with writer or artist Dan Brereton, 200 bucks. That's going right to the Hero Initiative. Uh, and then also added today, you get a chat and a bus sketch opportunity with artist Agnes Garbowska. She is absolutely awesome. I believe. Find somebody to host that one yet, Seawood? What's that? They find someone to host that one yet? I think uh, Chad went and lined up himself for that one. So you get a chance to see Comic Core Chad if you sign up for that one. Uh, but I hear also someone very awesome is hosting this Mark Wade panel that just went up today. That's right. I, I signed up for that one. Old Mark Wade interview. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I, hey, you Drew, you want to tell me about some Mark Wade fun we had at uh, Baltimore? Oh man, I just wish that mic was uh, was working because we had one hell of an interview. Uh, we talked about all things Mark Wade from all angles of his career, and it was really fun. Uh, so you can check that out on the Comic Core if you want to strain to hear it. If you don't want to strain to hear something, you can check out the remix. It's up in this live now. Yeah, absolutely. Mark, Mark Wade, Wade, one of my all-time favorite writers. I, I cannot wait for that opportunity to see you know him answer these questions he's going to get. And you know, I might try. No, I won't try sneaking one of mine. I'll just be in the background taking notes. And of course, we got some Tom King fans out there. Of course, you still got a chance to meet Tom King as well, writer of Heroes and Crisis, Vision, and Mister Miracle, of course. And of course, right now, Strange Adventures as well. But look at this, guys. Kevin Smith is on here now too. Kevin, yep. if you have a chance to get in a panel where you can basically have an eight-on-one conversation with Kevin Smith, and it's 60 full minutes. So that yeah. is an absolutely amazing opportunity right there, uh, 60 minutes with Kevin Smith. That, that's a pretty good one, in my opinion. No doubt about it, Carson. The creator of Clerk, so many great movies, those Jersey films. Drew's favorite, Chasing Amy. I did like that movie. That's a good one, yeah. That was one of my faves, too. That was the one that old freaking Palmiotti was in, and I gave Palmiotti hell about it. I said, like, yeah, I remember you in the Chase and Amy movie at your panel, at your little table in there. <laughs> that was good shit, pal. All right, let you know what else is good stuff. This Jay Wood Comics, $2 Super Chat, man. He's saying, make sure you Hulk smash that like button. Big, huge thanks to Jay Blitz dropping that Super Chat once again. That'll be going to the Hero Initiative as well. So big thanks to Rod. Big thanks to Jay Blitz. Jay Blitz, uh, man. One of the best best Jay Blitz, man. One, one a good veteran. Loves his vets. <laughs> and he also has some pretty good auctions he does with Z Collects over there. So if you like auctions, go check out some Jay Blitz comics. All right. So right now, I just dropped two links in the chat. Basically, these are going to be the two articles that I just pulled off the internet at random. Uh, we're going to talk about some video games. Um, so before we get into the articles and kind of say if we agree or disagree if they're picks or not, I want to go down the horn and just to get like maybe allow you guys to talk about one comic book based video game in particular uh, that is you've really enjoyed. But for oh man, they keep rolling in, guys. The yeah, super chats are coming in. Two ninety nine says for a good cause. Big thanks for that, oh. man. That's awesome. Once again, that two ninety nine. Hero initiative all day. Skeff's comic knowledge, big, huge thumbs up. 
So thank you once again. And it's red for summer. That's cool. I like it when they have the color variations. Mm -hmm. It's That's a like donation that. war. The more you, the more you donate, the better the colors get. <laughs> I guess that's true. But uh, Andy, I'll go ahead and start with you on this one. Uh, what's a comic book based video game you'd like to highlight or talk about? Oh God, yes. Thank you for starting with me because I'm going to start with my all time favorite, which is probably going to be one everybody's going to shudder at. But the original Punisher game on Nintendo. I grew up on a Nintendo, playing Duck Hunt, playing Super Mario, but when that game came out, that was the one game my parents told me I could never buy, so I repeatedly rented it week after week after week from Blockbuster for, I think, a year or better before I finally bought a used copy from somewhere, and I played that game to death, and even on the Game Boy version of that. That one wasn't great. It was kind of terrible, but it was Punisher, and it was mindless fun, and I loved it. Nice. Hey, here's our uh, clip of your Punisher there. That's so. That's the new. That's the newer arcade version. I couldn't find a GIF of the original Nintendo Punisher. Um, I think they did a they did a revamp version on Sega Genesis, which had the uh, side scrolling 2D action, and um, eventually our local Pizza Hut added that arcade version and the arcade version of TMNT, which I played a ton of as well. Oh yeah, Drew. What's a game you'd like to highlight before we get into our lists? I just did a countdown on the Daily Show, which isn't even daily any longer, uh, <laughs> uh, about this not long ago. Uh, and the one I'm going to talk about right now isn't my number one. It was my number two. It's Arkham City. Hmm. Arkham City is, is fantastic. It's fantastic. Was the X Men oh, game your number one? The arcade X Men was that your number one? No, no, my number one was Spider Man for the PS4. <laughs> All right, good game. Um, I I still think that that game is amazing. Uh, just the the voice acting alone in Arkham City gives it the nod. The fact that it's it, Arkham Asylum is such a great game, and they found a way to make it infinitely better. Uh, was just so amazing to me. The the mini challenge maps are seamlessly like put in with the combat maps and, and you don't really know what, what is what until you hit the next area. It's a, it's a fun game to even backtrack through to pick up collectibles. Like that, that's, that's my mark of a good game. Cause there's plenty of triple a titles out there that will give you all the bells and whistles. But if you give me all the bells and whistles on one map and it's not fun to come back through to collect the bells and whistles, I'm not going to do it. But to go back through an area to get Riddler trophies was never boring in any way. Uh, and it was perfectly paced. They're talking about adding like uh, citizens to the game next next iteration. And I don't know how the hell they're going to do that. Um, but I really enjoyed all the Arkham games. I think that it peaked with City, though. Uh, the, the next generation had great stuff with the Arkham Knight and the Batmobile, but you don't really need it city was the best yeah legend i know you've been playing some games recently yeah the one um one of the ones from my childhood that i remember the the first one that really just was freaking awesome because i beat the game and we rented it too so it was like man it was hard to beat the rented games because you didn't have a lot of time to do it but it was this superman game it was uh, on the nintendo entertainment system the publisher was called kim Kimco or something like that and the graphics were really funny because they made Superman look like a little basically like a little cabbage patch like head and you know running along and all this kind of stuff but the gameplay I mean the, the graphics were really babyish looking but the gameplay was freaking awesome and it, and it picked up you know after the Superman uh, or maybe during the Superman 2 because you got to fight the three uh, you know Zod of course was the last guy but you got to fight Non and old uh, Ursa or whatever her name was but anyway, damn good game. Of course, modern day, we got to look at the X-Men Legends. X-Men Legends 2, Age of Apocalypse, Marvel Ultimate Alliance, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2. Of course, my teams on Marvel Ultimate Alliance is always Fantastic Four. You know, you get 20 plus health per KO, and I mean, it's just freaking awesome. But uh, yeah, well, <laughs> but I love those games. And so there has been some good superhero ones, Carson. Uh, what about you, my friend? Oh, uh, well, you know the one I got to talk about. Oh, Teenage yeah. Mutant Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time on the Super Nintendo. Mm -hmm. um, that game, it was a game changer for me, to say the least. I remember 
obviously playing the main one in the arcade. And then it was basically the uh, TMNT 2 on the NES was the one that was based off of. But I kept, you know, I don't know if it was, I, was, I think I was just reading it through uh, Nintendo Power, uh, hearing about this new game that almost replicated the arcade experience exactly. Because mm-hmm. obviously the NES and the arcade, uh, there was one was eight bit, one was arcade, obviously, so they didn't look the same. But when the SNES one came out, I'm like, oh my god, this is like basically having the arcade at home, at least in my you know 10 year old, eight year old brain, however old I was. But uh, just turning that on for the first time and hearing Big Apple 3 a.m. was just mind blowing to me, and just getting a chance to play that and just the music in that game, too. Like, no one like the music is so good, like, not too many people talk about those. like konami super nintendo era soundtracks mm-hmm. and when they did the remake on the xbox live arcade about a decade ago they couldn't they didn't have the rights to the music and that took so much yeah out of the game experience for me especially like the pirate level and the train level where you fight leatherhead there's some really good tracks in there and it just it sucked a lot of the soul out of the game when they had to take those tracks out. And a lot of times music, Carson, a lot of times music really makes the game like, take me for a ride. Oh, yeah. Beep, beep, take me for a ride. ride. <laughs> what about? Blow my mind. Blow oh. my mind. <laughs> well, that's that's a wrestling game. Well, they do have wrestling comics, though. So. Yeah, you can always, we can always twist that in there. But. It's All just right, the best so soundtrack kinda, ever. We picked a highlight game for each, um, which... We don't need to talk on the uh, IGN top list of best top 10 best comic book video games ever made. Here's their top 10 list. And I can just kind of rapid fire most of these because we literally covered most of them. So 10 was TMNT Arcade, which I just talked about. Uh, Number nine was X-Men Legend. So actually, I kind of do want to stop here. So Legend, uh, you just mentioned how, you know, X-Men Legends was... You know, one of your highlights. Do you have a favorite one of that whole run? That oh. they did? Is Legends like the, the best one? Or would you say like Ultimate Alliance 1 or 2 would be a superior game? I would go back to the original X-Men Legends because, man, just for the time, it had a kick-ass storyline. I mean, you even had like flashback missions where you could see how Juggernaut destroyed the X Mansion while you're using the original, you know, five X Men characters. And what was cool was the uh, Beast, of course, was in his human form during that whole thing. So that was kind of interesting. But I really liked that one. Uh, once it got to the Marvel um, Ultimate Alliance one, they basically went Secret Wars on there. And then the other one went um, Civil War. And I just kind of prefer the simpler storylines you know what i mean of of the original x-men legends and when you know i got my original xbox out a while back and it's still in the living room i got this brand new hdmi converter so my original xbox can plug into the tv hdmi and man the games because you know some of the games on the original xbox were 720p Mm x-men legends is one of them so no doubt about it one of the best all right, Drew, I want to ask you about this next one, if you played it right, because I didn't play it, but I've heard nothing but great things. Incredible Hulk Ultimate Destruction. Yes, yes. And and it was kind of this precursor to, like, the open-world sandbox games, like Prototype. Uh, and uh, I guess Infamous was one of those games where you kind of run around as a character with powers. But Hulk, if he was printing, could run up the walls of the buildings grab the helicopters and rip them in half and beat other monsters to death with them and fight tanks. And uh, it was a really great open world experience. Um, it, I, I think it didn't really capture the story of the incredible Hulk, but as far as like being able to Hulk out and destroy things, it was all the fun parts. Yeah, the prior the prior game Carson was just the regular Hulk based off the classic Eric Bana movie, and that game was crap. Had those stealth missions? The stealth missions ruined it. Why would they put that in there? So yeah, what are you hiding from? Get angry and break stuff. That second one though, like like Drew said, you just got to beat the crap out of stuff. It was like playing the Warriors or something. You know, you just fight. (laughs) Wow. Well, Legend, the next one's in your wheelhouse. And I think they kind of, I mean, if you're making a top 10 list, this is just cheating here. So for seven, they put 
various Lego comic book games. <laughs> oh, yeah. Those are like, classics. Really? So yeah. I guess we can go around the horn here and actually identify one. So, Legend, I know you love the Legos. If you had to pick one to highlight, what would it be? It would probably be, and this is kind of funny because I really do like the new uh, villains when they came out with, but it's called Lego Batman 3, and it's basically mm -hmm. the all the colors of the spectrum. So it's really Lantern and Jeff Johns heavy, but you know, Lar Fleas, Atrocitus, Sinestro, St. Walker, Indigo Trap. It's all there, you know, so I'd have to go with that one. It's just, and it's DC characters. Oh yeah. Andy, did you ever get a chance to check out the Lego franchise? No, I really didn't. Um, and at face value, it wasn't something that interested me that much until now. Now I'm getting bigger into it because my son is big into these movies. Mm -hmm. and he enjoys them. So hopefully I can find these on the PlayStation Network and download them and play some of them. Drew? Uh, yeah, I like, uh, I'm like. i a big fan of the original Lego Marvel. Um, I have not played the Lego Avengers or Lego Marvel 2. Uh, Lego Batman was great. Um, Lego Batman 2 was fun. I don't give a shit about the Green Lantern, so I haven't played that Lego Batman 3 yet. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, for, for my money, Lego he, games... He, he sting me, but that was a sting. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah he stings <laughs> us. Uh, for, for my money with the Lego games, it's not even the comic book ones that are the best. I think that uh, Lego Harry Potter is the good. best Harry Potter game you're going to get out there. Lego Lord of the Rings is the best Lord of the Rings game you're going to get out there. It's uh, the level of detail uh, that they give uh, are you, you going to go Shadow of Mordor? That one wasn't bad. I actually kind of like the two towers on the PS2. You're going back there. Yeah, but I still think the Lego Lord of the Rings gave you more Lord of oh, the Rings. Oh, it's are great, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and the way that they built that map in the open world was mm -hmm. just, like, stunning to me um, in, in a way that they haven't done in the other games because I think that the Harry Potter and the uh, Lord of the Rings are the, are the way to go on those Legos. Mm hmm I wanted to highlight before. But yay, Marvel flying down from a helicarrier every time you want to start a mission. It's pretty dope. I use Ben Grimm when I fly in because I like landed hard. <laughs> rock. Yeah. I always like the. I don't, did you guys ever get a chance to play Lego Dimensions? Those games were a lot of fun. <laughs> like, unfortunately, it's pretty defunct now because it followed that formula of like Skylanders and stuff where uh, you had to go yeah, out and yeah. buy the figures and that stuff. But. I just think I, I got a chance to play with my nephews a couple holidays back and just to see their faces light up when you basically got to be Batman, Gandalf, Superman, and Krusty the Clown. Like it's just this <laughs> insane integration of like every property they had, they just threw at the wall. And it actually turned out to be a lot of fun. But before we move on to the list, I did want to highlight one more thing. I think Legend, you're probably the only other person who actually played this one. Um, it's kind of in the same vein as Lego, in my opinion, because it's mainly made for kids, but there's a lot of deep cuts inside the game, and that's a Scribble Knots Unmasked. Damn. I was wondering. Good that. freaking game. Oh, my God. So, man, Max and his sister, they got stuck over there into the DC dimension. So it's your classic parallel earth, multiple <laughs> dimensions and all that. And you go around the levels in Gotham, Daily Planet. You can get to go to Oa, and you start doing missions, and you start solving puzzles to get more of those little stars and all that. But, you know, the cool thing is, I mean, you could basically just type anyone's name in. So if you want Jonah Hex to help you, man, he's there. And, you know, you know, you he's know always what, there for me. You know what? <laughs> Y'all know what that RVD 420 means. I just smoked <laughs> your ass. But anyway, love that shit. But yeah, um, really great game if you can get it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, damn. Wasn't that only on the DS? Well, uh, no, it was on the you, but I think they've done some digital re-releasing of it. You might, I think you might be able to get a copy of it through the Switch store. Yeah, it's also on Steam Thanks. if you want to play it on yeah. PC. Well, um, I need to wait for Animal Crossing to not be a thing so my daughter will give up the Switch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. But just a really good game. Um, but you got to be kind of into it. You got to be into puzzle games, you know, and just kind of, you know, go to YouTube if you can't figure out. <laughs> <that's laughs> They're pretty cool, though. The Great Cheaters Show is this new channel. It's a sister <laughs> channel. But I always like playing that game. I would just turn it on and like type in anti monitor, summon mm. the anti monitor, maybe put in Cyborg Superman, Superboy Prime, and then just like type in Green Lantern Core, Blue Lantern Core, 
then like Larf leaves, and then like you just have this big battle and just see if you can like get the game to break basically, or who's gonna get killed. <laughs> Last start to summon, like, Earth, New Superman, Connor Kent, like the it, 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 there's a lot of possibilities in that game. A lots and a lot. I mean, the cuts go as deep as you want them to in that game. It's really impressive the amount of stuff. But Drew, uh, number six on this list, I, I know you're gonna want to talk about X Men Origins Wolverine. Oh, this game is great. It's like a God of War clone where you play as Wolverine and you just like combos and taking out helicopters and quick time events and all kinds of garbage, man. The best thing about this game is that as you fight, your flesh is torn from your body and as your health replenishes, the flesh reforms around your body. It's a really cool animation technique. And not only that, it's it's based off of the original script, which never got made into a movie, which has Trask and Sentinels and Mystique and all kinds of cool stuff in there that would have made X-Men Origins probably one of the better movies in the Fox uh, universe and kind of set the timeline up for everything that happened before instead of screw the timeline up like they did. Uh, uh, so it's exciting to see what could have been and it's also a really, really cool game. Absolutely. God, yeah, it looks good. So the next one, I, this one's a toss-up for me because we're kind of getting into the, the Lego situation again. So number five, they listed Marvel versus Capcom 3. And my question to you guys, is Capcom or Marvel versus Capcom 3 really better than the second one? I prefer the second one. Uh, my, my three, I don't know if I still have my three. It may be in the closet somewhere, but I may have sold it as well. But yeah, I'm I, I don't know where my copy's at. <laughs> I preferred number two, um, and I, I had the the downloadable one on the 360 when they re-released it, and I loved that cable juggernaut and sentinel combo. I mean, man, now number three was cool because man, Hagar, you got to play as Mike Hagar, you got to play as little uh, Sir whatever his name is from Goose and Gold. Go, whatever ghost and goblins mm -hmm. I mean, so there was some cool things there but man that number two sometimes i just think simpler is better you know what i mean oh absolutely yeah i just showed my team on the screen like this is the most yeah. overpowered character in the history of games mm -hmm. cable? capcom 2 cable the white ah, button sentinel well i say cable because he has that white button <laughs> that it's just a, he just fires his gun and it takes away like a yeah. six your health bar. Gun, right, and, don't play this. Arm, gun and sentinel arm combo. You, that you guys don't all have this downloaded. We I have it on the Dreamcast, this. man. Uh, <laughs> Dreamcast <laughs> is the way to go. I'm, I'm going to tell you this much. I really, really enjoyed Marvel versus Capcom 3. I thought I did, all man. the innovations were, were really great. I thought that the graphical update was stellar. Mm -hmm. I thought that, you know, the second that we got Street Fighter 4, I was like, Okay, now they need to do this with Marvel versus Capcom, and they did. Uh, the problem is that they didn't put as much into it as they did the previous iteration. Just so many characters into mm -hmm. it's just endless combinations. The music is that one freaking song Take at the menu, her. which drives you nuts, but is also the most nostalgic fucking thing you can ever hear. <laughs> fucking iconic. Here's what I love about two is my buddy had a dreamcast and I moved in with this guy and we had this apartment when we we'd go out and, you know, we're going to go to a party. We're going to throw down some shots, go, go meet some girls, ride. right? How do you pregame? Well, you, you drink as much as you can before you go somewhere where you got to pay for drinks or you drink as much as you can so that you don't have to worry about, Oh, are there drinks at the party with the, you know, just make sure that you got a good buzz going out the door and there's no quicker way than doing that than turning all the turbo speed up and playing rounds for shots you're gonna get fucked in like 30 minutes flat <laughs> <laughs> that's and right. that's how we would pregame all right load up the dreamcast I'm gonna take you for a ride jack up that turbo get that bottle of rum and let's get this thing oh, started rum oh oh you gotta be taken for the ride andy i'm sorry but rum though I mean, there's so many choices. Sailor Jim. Yeah, there are so many choices. <laughs> the Captain Morgan guy back in the day. Andy, any memories of seeing this one in the arcade? No, not as much as I'd like. Ah, uh, I wish, um, but I don't. All right, so number four. Here's an interesting one. It, it specifically says The Wolf Among Us, but 
the Telltale game series have actually been pretty good to comics as well. I'm thinking particularly the Walking Dead franchise with yeah. that character Clementine. Andy, did you get a chance to play these? I played the first season of that and I enjoyed it tremendously, but I did not hop on for season two. And I'm actually kind of glad I didn't. There weren't great reviews on season two. Um, and at first, it being called a game kind of felt like a misnomer. Uh, a misnomer. It, to, to me, it didn't really feel like a game. It really felt like I was being pulled into a comic book. But um, what you guys and Kat and Mark and Chad and Drew choose your own adventure, choose, choose your own mystery kind of thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, which was a pretty dope way of doing it in 21st century with a digital comic book. I still don't necessarily feel that that was a game, though. I don't know about you guys. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like when we played Choose Your Adventure, that was a game. And these adventure games, like, it, it, games used to be a lot different. Like, this is a throwback <laughs> to a people. Anyone remember Zork? <laughs> I mean, yeah, basic, basically, it's, it's their take on, like, a King's Quest, but with The Walking Dead. Um, and it holds your hand a lot more than those old games did, um, just because it has the ability to. But it's like what those uh, DOS based games almost. Yeah, Legend, they were Williams. all they were all they were all text based, where mm -hmm. you would tell it to do what you wanted it to do. But in this, like, you kind of have to find find like, the icons and and things of that nature. So it's kind of the it, it, it's kind of a handheld like a, they're, they're walking you through King. an adventure game. But once you get used to what the situation is all those trappings of them walking you through it disappear and it doesn't feel like a game so much because you're just experiencing it. And that's what makes an adventure game kind of beautiful and seamless. Um, that's what you want out of it. You want to be like, Oh, well I experienced that story. Well, you didn't experience that story. You experienced it happening on a screen. You know, you, you but, typed those commands in back in right. the eighties. And what was so cool about it in King's quest two, I found this cave. It had this witch in there named Hagatha. I go up to Hagatha on Hagatha side. I put hump Hagatha and, Hagatha, and then in the computer would tell me Hagatha wouldn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> it was so cool. And it was 1983. I didn't know no better. You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's gotta be why it didn't feel like a game to me then. You know it's I mean? just it's just not a genre you're used to playing. There's a lot more games out there that are like that. And I don't I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that like that that must have it must have been doing its job so well in, in, as far as immersion goes. Right. I didn't feel like I was just sitting there smashing buttons and no. doing the repetitive gameplay. It's like a conversation I just had with my kid. She's like the the biggest game out right now, no doubt, is Animal Crossing. It is <laughs> the biggest thing in games right now, and she's explaining to me all the things you do in it. And I'm like, so like it sounds like to me, it sounds like she's playing Skyrim, like but without the part of that game that makes it awesome. It's like, <laughs> oh, so there's like no swords or horses or dragons or fights or skeletons or dungeons to explore. You just like plant flowers around the house and make clothes. She's like, yeah. I'm like, is it fun? She's like, yeah. It's like, well, more power to you. Let me know when I can have my Mario Kart machine back. Tell her <laughs> you, you, she can do it at home and earn money. <laughs> All right, you her home. ass outside. Number three on the list. They, they tied them. Injustice 1 and 2. Great games. I agree. Uh, two is a better game. One has a much better story. Yeah, I agree there. Better story in one, two better game. Two has a lot of really great downloaded characters, too. Mm -hmm. you, so, can, you can be the TMNTs. Rapid Fire. That's one guy. Two of you guys in the basement down there. Marvel vs. Capcom franchise or the Injustice franchise? Legend, I'll start with you. Injustice all the way. Injustice for life. DC for life. He's just doing this. What have you done for me lately? Bullshit. I'm <laughs> telling you right now that if if somebody said, hey, man, we're going to drink beers, do a little Jonah Hex and play one game all night long. Is it going to be Injustice 1 or 2 or is it going to be Marvel vs. Capcom 2? I guarantee you we're playing Marvel vs. Capcom 2 and we're playing it all night long and we're not getting tired of it. Nice. Well, you, you might get tired of it if you lost 22 times in a row. King of the I, Hill guy I, right I, here. I play with Gambit in the second row. You, you're dead. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm spamming <laughs> Padukins. Party. I'm spamming Padukins at party. you in a way that you cannot handle, my friend. Knocking him down. Knocking him down. And finally, I just had to let some guy win, and I let the shittiest guy win. That, that guy, his name's King Joe. I think he's got a YouTube channel on here. King Joe Comics and Collectibles. He, I let him win, but boy, 22-0 and 0 on that night. You know what they say about that King Joe? <laughs> 
He got for a ride. <laughs> he was taken. That's right. All right. So number two on this list is Marvel's Spider Man. I gotta say, uh, easily top two in my opinion. This game it had everything and more you wanted from a Spider Man game. Obviously, they used the template established from the Spider Man Two game that they made from the movie back in the PS2 Xbox original era. And oh my God, they! I mean, this is the best thing. And it's probably my favorite game of this last generation. Drew, I know you said you played. Oh, they it completely all. lifted the combat from Arkham, which was the smartest thing they mm -hmm. could have possibly done. They kept everything about the swinging that they've been doing for the last what, thirty years. Uh, it's it's really close to being a perfect game. I like to call it a half system seller, um, because I really really wanted a PS4 when I saw God of War, and then. I was like, well, Spider Man's coming out, so there's two games I can I can reconcile spending four hundred, five hundred dollars for two games. One game, not so much. Two games, I'll do that. And to this day, people are like, oh, you have this for your PS3? It's like, no, it's my God of War Spider Man machine, and it will be until the new God of War, the new goddamn Spider Man comes out, which isn't going to be till the PS5. So screw me. But uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll play God of War and Spider Man all day long. Uh, I think that uh, it's just really well produced, really well put together. The story is great in a way that is like it kind of insists upon you knowing who Spider-Man is, but who doesn't. Um, but at the same time, will retell you everything that you need to know about Spider-Man at the same time. It's, it's, it's He's established as Spider-Man when the game starts, but there are plenty of villains that he is yet to encounter and plenty of villains who he's like, I, I beat you up all the time, you know? So it's, it's a lived in world. Spider-Man feels like he is a key part of the world and uh, there's innocent people running around, which is something that the Arkham games haven't been able to figure out. So yeah, I thought it was cool. Speaking of number one is the Arkham series. So, uh, I mean, I think that was the easy shoe in for me drew to go back to your point from the beginning of this topic. I think Arkham city, I agree would probably be my personal choice. Mm -hmm. If I had to pick the best one, I think that set the template that made the Arkham series really go off the chain in a lot of people's minds. So I think Arkham Asylum, great game. Still that like Metroidvania style gameplay. Yeah. Uh, but it was missing that open world factor. So when they introduced that, that just changed everything. But when I heard they were making Arkham 9, I'm like, well, there's no way they're going to be able to top Arkham City. And in my opinion, they kind of did in a way. But I mean... The Batmobile is kind of hit or miss for me. At the end of the day, I had fun with it once I got used to the controls, but there was a bit of a hurdle there. The tank mode was just kind of unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Like, it's necessary to give the Batmobile a way to fight in certain situations, but the amount of the tank mode missions that there were, it's just like, why are we doing this? Um, but beyond that, I think that that game is damn near perfect. Uh, they did telegraph the story. Anybody who, who's read any comics in the last 10 years knew exactly what was happening the entire way through the story. Uh, but I don't think that was necessarily for us as much as it was for the general public who wasn't as aware. Uh, and uh, the Riddler trophies, again, something really fun to do. Uh, they, But they, it, it stepped it way up from um, uh, the Arkham Origins, which kind of... I felt like an expansion pack. It did. Well, the problem was that the world didn't feel nearly as immersive. There weren't the Riddler trophies or anything like that. So it kind of felt empty in between missions. But the thing where that really shined that they brought into Arkham Knight was the boss fights all felt unique and different. Who's that? Well, it's Kevin Conroy. Hey, you know, that's it, man. It's when you gotta, <laughs> who's that guy? Who's that young guy standing next to him? <laughs> oh, boy. Is that your son? Hey, I don't know, dude. Some dude with long hair. Hey, but uh, man, you know what though? Conroy, the voices on those first two Batman Arkham games, Kevin Conroy, Mark he came back Adam, for night too. Man, all good, man. All good right there. No, oh, absolutely. So uh with that list, Andy, I'll start with you. Are there any omissions from this top list that you think are missing off of this that you've played before? No, and you want to know what? I've finally realized after the last 20 minutes of everybody else talking what I had been doing this entire past 15 years instead of playing these games. The entire time I had been building computers and playing the Call of Duty series and the Battlefield mm. series. 
Mm. Stop building computers. I, get a console. I should have been. I should have been playing all these other games because uh, where am I at now? You can still go back, bro. You can go back. Virtual yeah. consoles are, are the best thing about yep. this newest so, generation of gaming. So I'm glad you brought that up here because while I have a moment to speak before I run too long, I want everybody in the chat and everybody that's listening on the replay to go ahead and after the video post, comment down below on what I should get. I finally bought a PlayStation 4 a couple months ago. What's the one game on the PlayStation Network? That Here's I what you need with? to do. You need to take your PlayStation 4 to the <laughs> yep. GameStop and get an Xbox One, and sign up for Game Pass and play all of the Arkham games. They're available to play for free if you pay for like the $20 a month Game Pass or whatever. It's not even that much, is it? How much but is Game for, Pass? For, but for now, everybody go in, comment, what's the one game Come I on. on the PlayStation Network that's comic book related that I should download right now and play? Oh, uh, well, there is this game called Spider-Man we talked about like five minutes ago. I would should, highly But like. should I? But yes. should I? Yeah, well, yes. chat, Immediately. tell her. Get in those comments and then here's uh, here's what you should up. do, Andy. Start playing Spider Man, and when your wife goes, "Hey, the baby," you just go ah, sh 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 sh, and keep playing Spider Man until she hits you in the head with something. That I'll means just, it's time to stop playing Spider. -Man. I'll just go flap. Stop talking. <laughs> All right, Legend. Any omissions that you cite on this list here? Well, you know, I didn't see the old uh, Superman on the N sixty four on the list. Oh, we're, we're, oh, yeah. we're, oh, we're, we're, we're going to get there. Coming up here in a second. I do have <laughs> yeah. one omission. I don't have any, and no, it's dude. not it's not technically a single comic book property, but there was an MMO called City of Heroes, yeah, which, inc okay. which included well. every single comic book trope from westerns to sci fi to romance. And and even the villains expansion, where that you can play as the bad guys. To, you make your own hero. You 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 work in a persistent world. Uh, I, I, it's probably not even around anymore. I don't think I had a pirate zombie on City of Villains. <laughs> I had a couple really good characters, man. That were pretty high level. Oh, I played that. Played that. What server did you play on? I played on Justice. I think I played on Justice too. Fuck. We yeah, should have uh, up on there. <laughs> well, I I was only playing East Coast like super late at night because yeah. I would get home from a restaurant <laughs> gig when my daughter was an infant and I'd finally get her to sleep and then I'd play all night until my wife would wake up back in the day. Here, man, that sounds like when when my kids, I, I you know, the little papooses you put the kid in there, yeah, you get the city of heroes. <laughs> all right, so with all that, we're now gonna dive in. To, to our worst list. list. I'm not going to cover the whole thing because we're kind of limited on time right now. So I'm just going to cover the top We got four. plenty of time to shit on bad video games. <laughs> we could we can spend all night here, but I'm just going to cover the top four because I do want to talk about number four. So number four on this list is Aquaman Battle for Atlantis for the GameCube and the Xbox. A game that was so bad uh, on uh, G4 X-Play made their worst game of the year award. They named it like the Aquaman, basically. So a lot wow. of slow fighting, swimming through hoops, a familiar sounding awful trend that we're going to talk about here in a few. Um, Drew, I don't know if you played <clears throat> number three, but is Uncanny X-Men for the NES? I so did not play Uncanny X-Men for Drew, the NES. I need to cover. Is it, Actually, Andy, you want to cover this one here? We got a super chat. Number two? No, we got a super chat in the chat. Oh, hey. Super sticker. Oh, boy. Hey, Mom. Thanks for the super chat. Yeah, 4 dollars super chat goes directly to the Heroes Initiative, helping those creators in need. I call my mom and ask her why she's not donating. <laughs> so big thanks to Andy's mom for the Bravo super sticker. Unfortunately, it doesn't pop up on our uh, stream yard end, but you guys can see it in the chat. So big thanks for that. So. Uh, the next game on the list, uh, Uncanny X-Men. Uh, this is LJN at its worst. I never Tom played it. I never played those LJN games, but I Back believe this is the one money. where, like, if Wolverine's uh, claws are popped, you lose health. Yeah, like, it was. You have, like, a little meter. Every time you use the mutant power, that meter shrinks. So they're limiting the mutant powers in an X-Men game. Mm. Legend, do you have any memories of playing LJN games? 
Uh, the the Back to the Future was very hard. I think my brother actually beat it, but I never could get that far on it. Plus, they had Back to the Future 2 and 3, um, which if you wanted to play Back to the Future 3's portion of the game, the password's Flux Capacitor, if you have the old cartridge. <laughs> but yeah, all hard games. Uh, I think even Friday the 13th was an LJN. Jason oh, wow. always killed me for the most part <laughs> on that one. Yep. I mean, there was just so many of those LJNs. Some of the wrestling ones were LJN, but they, and yep. they were bad too, but. Yeah, just got yeah. off games. Some also, of those. Uh, lack of shout out for X Men Spider Man Arcade's Revenge. For this, I liked that, that game. Was a good one. Oh, I couldn't play it. I was pretty decent on that one. I never beat it, but I, I got pretty far. I beat the Gambit level, the Spider Man <laughs> level, the Cyclops level, and I don't think I never. I, that's as far as I can go. I beat about three levels. Uh, <laughs> I I don't know, man. I. Uh, that game was out on the SNES, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And that came out around the same time that the Sega Genesis X-Men was out. Um, I enjoyed the Sega Genesis X-Men um, probably more than Arcade's Revenge. I played Arcade's Revenge more than I played the Sega Genesis X-Men game. Mm -hmm. wow. Because I ha I didn't have a Genesis at first. Mm -hmm. I was a, We were a Nintendo family, and it took a while for us to get that Genesis. Uh, we were... A, we were at least a Christmas behind on the Genesis. So yeah, we were a Nintendo family until the PlayStation came out. And I didn't even know what a Super Nintendo was. Wow, cool. Nice. It well, was number super two. Heavy. It was super. Number two, if anyone's played this game, you'll be familiar with this screen. Silver mm -hmm. Surfer on the NES. One of the most nails hard games you will ever play in your life. Pretty much like it kind of follows like the, the shmups formula of like Gradius or Ikaruga, where you're just flying and the whole everything, the whole universe is out to kill you, basically. And in Silver Surfer, that's no exception. So did anyone ever get a chance to get a headache playing this one? <laughs> no, but it sounds awesome. Yeah, I, 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 never I can't played it. the angry video game nerds coverage on that game enough. Um, it, it, he puts it in words I can't. Obviously, I, I don't want to say half those words on the internet anyway because it's the anger video game nerd. But just to see some of the uh, the clip, like just some of the gameplay clips he has of like some of the awful clipping in that game where like a bull will be traveling across the screen. Not even be close to him and then somehow he'll, he'll die anyway. Uh, it's just priceless. Scott yeah, and Taco Evans needs to get himself an Xbox. Yeah, before before you get to number one really quick, Scott, yeah, it does make a great point. Atari had a run of uh, Star Wars games that we didn't even cover, too. Super oh. Nintendo had the best Star Wars games. Oh, we didn't even talk about Star Wars amazing. But yeah, uh, Rogue Squadron, come on. Yeah, that's a good game. I mean, right. uh, well, I mean, you got uh, Shadows of the Empire for the 64. Oh, yeah, that too. Dash you, got a jet, you got a jetpack to fight Boba Fett or Boba Fett to get a jetpack. By the way, before we get into our first Dope. first one, I know this guy's gonna like this next game. Actually, before we get into our next game, I do want to say hi to Chaos and Comics. It says N64 best Star Wars games. I actually agree 100 percent with that. And of course, those sides, those side scroller Super in Nintendos Japan. were good, man. They were good too. They were difficult, but they were great. Some of the legendary like the end of Return of the Jedi with blowing up the Death Star, of course, legendary, but before we get into the obvious number one, does anyone have anything else they want to throw out there for duds? Worst video games they've ever played related to comics? You know, one of the worst ones, and it's also an angry on the angry video game nerd guy, is the original Nintendo Entertainment Systems Dick Tracy. God, oh, man, I love that game. That game, hard as hard. hell. Because yep. when you're driving through the towns to pick the clues up, there's snipers on the rooftops. And uh, even the old angry video game nerd, he thought, well, you can get out of your car and shoot the snipers and then get back in the car. But I mean, like, God, it just takes forever. Just god awful mechanics. But, yeah. yeah, but a precursor to Grand Theft Auto. True. That's true. Andy, shake your head like that. That game was innovation. Just like that first terrible Ninja Turtles game was innovation. The um, uh, Ultra original, games. Bad. the original Punisher game on the Game Boy was wasn't great. Oh. oh, I still played the living daylights out of it, but it wasn't great. <laughs> Drew, anything else you want to add? Um, yeah, uh, one of the most disappointing games that I've ever like been excited for and pre-ordered and spent money on is Marvel, uh, Marvel Universe: Rise of the Imperfects. Mm -hmm. I pre-ordered that. Mm. What a piece of shit game yeah. that was. 
there was also another game around this time. It was when Our World Ultimate Alliance hit big. And I can't remember the subtitle. Maybe one of you guys can help me out. But it was that Justice League game. Yeah, for so, uh, yeah, on had, the Xbox and like PS2, I think. Had John Stewart on there. Yeah, it was pretty much their answer to the uh, Marvel Ultimate Alliance franchise. And it was not a very good answer. I think it was only two player instead of four player. Mm-hmm. And just the possibilities were not there near as close as that whole deep roster they had in Ultimate Alliance. So. Yeah, it was like Superman sucked. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Like, like flimsy. Like don't don't make Superman a flimsy character. Well, it's funny you mention all that you just said because we're gonna hop into our number one. <laughs> Superman sixty four. Jesus, god. look at this game. <laughs> it is so god awful. Like I rented it once from Blockbuster in sixty four. And, like, normally you'd have the game for, like, Friday night, Saturday night. You'd take it back Sunday night. I think we took this shit back Saturday morning. (laughs) Before before the Saturday morning cartoons came on, it was that just that bad and shitty. And then we got something else. I think they were nice enough to give us a trade or something for free. That's all you did. You stood in a corner under a security camera, and you were just. You look like a mongoloid. Just imagine what you're doing with yourself in the corner. You know, Superman 64, that's what you get. <laughs> I, I like that he made sure to return it before Saturday morning cartoons came out. Yeah, I had to, man. I had to. Oh, my God. Bear Island. Bear Island may just have to go to the night. It's like the Dire Straits Money for Nothing video. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, Chad R. Shouts out WWE 2K20. That's a whole different topic for another uh, time. Well, WWE is a comic book now, so I guess that's a comic book game. But I do, yeah, anyway, I do want to tell my story on Superman 64 because me and my brother pre-ordered this game uh, Mm -hmm. when it originally came out because we're excited. Like, we love the Nintendo 64. Obviously, in our household, we're DC Comics. We we enjoyed the Death Return of Superman because Chad's in the chat now. I want to shout that out. Fun game. You got to play as Steel. You got to play as Superboy. What else (laughs) could you want? But Superman 64 was the next evolution of the superhero game. Couldn't wait to see what the graphics held up. We played awesome games like Mario 64 and Ocarina of Time on this console. Like, yeah, we're going to use that same power, and we're going to get our first huge Superman game. And holy oh God, it's horrible. It starts off, and you're flying through freaking rings. And you have to fly through them in 90 seconds or less, or you have to start the whole level over. Yeah. When you're starting any game ever, why would you? Why? Who? What? Is, what they want to teach they? you how to fly. They wanted to show you right off the bat that the controls were broken. Yeah, exactly. Like it's one thing to be like, okay, this is how you fly, but it doesn't work. <laughs> like it's like exactly the controls are broken. It's like I want a port imagine? of the Superman game from Nintendo 64 on the PS3 where you have to control it with the 6S controller and make somebody kill themselves. <laughs> like I think Starbucks had that perfect balance. Like they have a two, you can select tutorial and you can fly through rings in that game. But the difference is number one, you can select if you want to do it or not. Number two, it actually works. And it was the previous console generation. So then chat also shouts out that young justice game. I never got a chance to play that one, but I didn't hear the best things about it. So any other thoughts on Superman 64? Did anyone else have the displeasure? <laughs> Of playing the this tripe, the, the yeah. I mean this. <laughs> that game right there yeah. reminds me of all those ET cartridges that Atari <laughs> put in that dumpster years ago, because <laughs> the game was so bad they they couldn't get rid of them. They they just started throwing them in the dumpster. <laughs> That's how that N sixty four one reminded me of. No, there's not enough landfills for Superman sixty four. <laughs> <Bad. laughs> Really bad. I, I've never. I, that was definitely easily the first game we pro We immediately wanted our money back, and there's like no, yeah, nope, nope. Yeah. It's open. You're screwed. All right. So that wraps up our video game topic. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed that. Uh, while you guys were talking, I managed to get this poll up for next week. So what we'll yeah. be rereading next week. You guys have a choice of five options. So option one is our runner-up. That would have been this week. That's Vision by Tom King. So that was second place. So therefore, it gets that second place pity spot on the poll. So you have another opportunity to get that voted in. 
And this, I think I spelled Gaiman wrong. I'm so sorry, Rob Worst. He's going to kill me. But anyway, uh, my pick I threw in, maybe Drew's horse will be sick or die or something. I just went and threw Sandman by Neil Gaiman on there uh, because I've been dying. I rewrite the first issue. <laughs> I want to keep reading it. And I think it's one of those ones that, are, you know, really showed what the comic medium could do, you know, after Watchmen came out, after Dark Knight Returns. You had stuff like Grant Morrison's Animal Man. Uh, and then, of course, Neil Gaiman's Sandman. So I definitely want to put Sandman in here eventually. So I figured, why not go ahead and do it today? Uh, Legend, why don't you go ahead and tell us about Six Gun by Cullen Bunn. Man, Six Gun by Cullen Bunn, a phenomenal story. Sometimes on Tuesday nights when you're watching Golden Guys, you'll hear old DS comics talk about these little uh, weird kind of, uh, I can't remember how he, he phrased it, but they're kind of scary, weird horror comics. Um, it's just like a throwback like that. It's it's a weird Western style story. So even though it's set in the old West, you get sci-fi, supernatural, all kind of great stuff coming at you. Six gun people. So imagine six revolvers. Each one has a power like none other. And you know, if the whoever has all six of those, pretty much will have world domination in the old west written by colin bunn illustrated by brian hurt you will be hurt if you don't read the six gun volume one i think it's called cold dead hands our fingers something like that but it's a good book <laughs> all right the next option on here comes from drew and he he must have a thing for thanos because this time he's picking thanos by jeff lemire it's been on the poll before um but it was never in a second place position i think it was up against some stiffer competition last time around uh but lemire's run on thanos man was fantastic thanos is dying what's he gonna do well he's gonna find a way to win that's what he's gonna do he's gonna be brutal the entire way through it and uh you know it's gonna be good because it's written by lemire come on that's a vote that you need to spend there folks go to that community tab click that thanos button and feel better about your life all right, and the last pick comes from Andy. This is actually one I haven't read yet and really want to. Once in Future by Karen Gillen. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's a pretty fun story. It's just like, you know, um, I wanted to throw something in the mix that was a little less serious and, and a little more fun, and I felt like Once in a Future fit that, where it, it's got some deep elements without being a labor-intensive read. You know what I mean? And you also got Karen Gillan because y'all had read the Darth Vader. So that was from Karen Gillian too. So we're getting bringing Karen back to the poll, eh, Andy? Yeah. yeah. Gillan's spot, except for that one time I put Wicked in the Divine. I don't think that got a single vote. <laughs> but Karen Gillan, great writer. I, mm -hmm. I hope I, I I hope they all win. <laughs> They're all great. So um I, i'm looking forward to next week no matter Can't what we sell sandman a little more like hey are you a fat girl who shops at hot topic you'd love this <laughs> what well that's what t-shirt sales tell me i just want to hear andy laugh again what happened what just happened <laughs> <laughs> we're leaving that gif in the modern men thing for the rest of time now yeah <laughs> <anything Yeah. is laughs> Let's go ahead and get this wrapped up. So big huge oh, thanks. Hold on, hold on. I, I gotta I gotta do something real quick and I gotta drop this in the chat. It's gotta it's gotta happen. I'm copying. We're coming back. We're pasting. If you guys like music and you like Yetis, you should check out the Comic Core remix <laughs> about Yetis. There yes, you go. Please, please do. That's all I got. Just send it to Tony Schiavone. He'll talk about Yetes all day. But anyway, hey, thank you. Thanks to the great legend for joining us tonight. So, legend, where can people find you, man? You can find me over at youtube.com forward slash all dot in 95, where the great legend's always coming at you live with comics, cooking, gaming, and the truth. And tomorrow, you're going to see me do a special package video from none other than Golden Guys, host with the most jd comics some say his name is jd flair but better than better than carlos's package it's better. everything's better than carlos's package that's why we left him to carlos die on the side of that mountain 
but that's it. That'll be tomorrow night. Look for that somewhere in between the eight central to nine central hour or eight central to nine, nine Eastern, if you will. <laughs> I don't even know. Damn it. Your turn, Carson. <laughs> yeah, we're having fun here tonight. Andy, where can people find you, man? Hopefully somewhere that's not so laughable. Uh, oh my you can find me here every Monday night, enjoying things as much as possible. Sometimes they drag me along on Wednesdays for a laugh track for obvious reasons. And Thursday nights, Andy Given Thursdays, you can find me there. Um, Piggy's Out podcast, when this whole world gets back to its right normal self, we'll do another one of those. And I've got my own channel. Check my own channel at Comic Man Andy. Doing some fun stuff over there. If you like grading, I'm kind of doing my own little vlog about that now, too. Awesome. Well, you can find me, Seawater19. That's youtube.com forward slash Seawater19. I'll be going live probably right before Legends unboxing tomorrow. I think I'm going to do a top five quarantine binge reads. Uh, Drew, you probably did that on your daily show, but I'm going to probably steal it if you haven't or have. Hey, man, go for it. So I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to talk about some fun reads I enjoyed. Maybe recommend some of those C and D list characters you guys like so much. Um, also, if you search Comics of the Atom on iTunes, Mike just dropped our most recent episode recorded yesterday. Uh, we covered Astonishing X-Men's 18 through 24. So we're almost to the very end of the arc. We're going to do one more episode as an epilogue, basically. Uh, but we got to read the Unbreakable arc, and it was I, I forgot how good that last arc of X-Men was. So uh, can't wait for you guys to give me some feedback on that. And, of course, here on the Comic Core, One Day Modern Men, and Fridays on the Comic Core Roundtable with those gentlemen there at the bottom of your screen. Uh, but until next time, whoops. <laughs>